So, warm welcome uh, to this third webinar uh, in the PCC arena. Uh, a webinar we are uh, have named the state of person-centered care, unraveling the evidence and charting the future. My name is Axel Wolf, I'm a professor sorry, and the center director of GPCC, which is the a leading center of person-centered care research. And uh, today we will dive into uh, a discussion stemming from a recent systematic review that we have chosen for uh, today, uh, where we try to interpret the evidence regarding the outcomes and the cost effectiveness of person-centered care for adults with serious physical illness. And uh, we have invited some guests today experts in the field, and uh, next to me we have Professor Eva Wikström, Professor David Edarsson, and Professor Richard Sovatsky, that will critically reflect on the current evidence, but also, maybe more important, the future implication that we can uh, look for um, discussing this study. So I have mentioned it before, but I will briefly uh, present the current panel today once again. Here we have Eva Wikström, a professor in health governance at the University of Gothenburg and the director for a center for health governance at the University of Gothenburg and former deputy dean for education at the School of Business, Economics and Law at the University of Gothenburg. And she has her expertise in governance, leadership, collaboration, teams and communication, uh, and change management in healthcare as well as public and private sectors. It's also great to welcome David Edvardsson, a uh, professor of nursing at the La Trobe University in Melbourne in Australia. He's also an uh, advisor at GPCC and uh, the deputy dean also back at the university in La Trobe. And you are an expert in person-centered care and the development and testing of intervention. Maybe the, I don't know which, lo which is the longest distance between Australia and Canada, but uh, then we also have Richard Savatsky. He is a professor of nursing and the Canadian research chair in equitable uh, people-centered health measurement at the Trinity Western University in British Columbia, Canada. And he is a leader in person-centered outcome measurement and quality of life assessments in healthcare with a particular emphasis on people living with chronic life-limiting illnesses and their families and caregivers. And my co-host for today um, is Annika Lindström. She is uh, a member of the GPCC Person Council and also from Autism Sweden and uh, somewhat of a professional host in this kind of setting. Uh, so I'm very, very glad that you also are my side. And we will, uh, like I said, we will discuss a systematic review that we have chosen. And uh, you are all welcome to uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, the questions we will then look at during the break. So what will happen is that I will have a very, very short summary of the article. And then we will ask each one of our experts to put it into the context of their expertise. And then we open up for a, a discussion and a, uh, between ourselves. Uh, and I think that will take around 30 minutes to 40 minutes. And then we take a break for 15 minutes. And during the break, uh, you are also able to ask questions, but then we are able to look at the questions and to see uh, uh, which questions that arise from the audience and that will then answer when we come back after the break. So it's important that you stay tuned for the entire seminary, hopefully. So let's begin. And in order to begin, I need to find my clicker. And we chose for this seminar a systematic review that was published in 2022. Uh, first author was Canada Nekoma, a systematic review of impact of person-centered intervention uh, for serious physical illness in terms of outcomes and cost. And we chose this systematic review both because it looked at interventions, uh, both from an outcome but also from a cost effectiveness perspective, but also that it is widely available, with open access, so you are able to uh, download it 
and to read it because we know that the audience today are both uh, practitioners, researchers, uh, patient representatives uh, and uh, the public as such. So in that sense it was important to have an article to, to, uh, to read that everyone could look at. And we have made a very, very short summary of the article. It's, it's, a, it's a huge article in that sense. Uh, and in order to do the summary, uh, I've asked ChatGPT to do a summary in four slides, which also reflects on new technology that we can use AI for uh, gathering, but mainly also summarizing data and, and uh, the, the evidence out there. But you need to put it then into some sort of context and to discuss it with the experts in order to, to, to make some sense of it. But if you look at the introduction of the article, uh, it states that it's uh, person-centered care is an international concept and it's a critical attribute of high quality healthcare. And this study, this systematic study, aims to review and evaluate the evidence from interventions that aim to deliver person-centered care, PCC, for people with serious physical illness. So as you see here, it's about interventions of person-centered care and the demarcation is for people with serious physical illness. If you look at the method, they searched uh, in a systematic way the literature using different databases like CNAL and Cochrane, Embase, Medline. And they found a total of 6,156 papers. And they did this search between uh, 2020 and 2022. Um, and after a screening process that they also describe in the article, they found 72 papers. Uh, and of those 72 papers, there were 55 different studies. So some studies had several papers that reported on the study. And uh, looking at the results, um, they chose to, to, uh, to present the result in, they, they looked at, uh, they found two themes, and maybe we can discuss the themes later on, but they, they saw that uh, the articles, um, <coughs> the patterns was in self-management intervention, which consisted of training of patients and or caregivers and stuff. And where they show effects in reducing, for example, hospital admission, improving quality of life and reducing cost of care. And the other theme that they uh, interpreted the data from is technology-based interventions, using, for example, mobile phones, apps, ta uh, tablets uh, or videos. And those interventions showed uh, some improvements for self-efficacy, uh, hospitalization, length of, hosp uh, length of stay. Uh, and another re uh, result that they are uh, reporting is that the majority of studies did not report on a framework or a model. Um, going to the discussions, <coughs> um, they discussed that few studies combine technology with self-management interventions. Um, and that most studies were conducted in high-income countries, uh, which limits the generalizability of the findings. Um, so this was a, a brief summary of the of the article, and uh, as I said, it's 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 a huge article. I mean, <laughs> they try to <coughs> summarize and describe the 50, uh, 72 studies. So of course, it's hard to summarize this kind of article, and that's why we invited free experts in different fields in order to, to, to put it into context. Um, maybe not only for the evidence, because evidence maybe is already old when you publish it in systematic reviews in that sense, and evidence is always something evolving, but to also look for what is the, the future and what are the implications for future in different contexts. So I would like to, to start with David about um, if you could put context into the, the systematic review uh, regarding person-centered care and also um, maybe about the future of testing person-centered care. Hmm. No, sure, thank you, Axel. <laughs> um, and thank you, Gothenburg University and GPCC for the invite. This is a great opportunity to talk to colleagues and to, to you about you know, my, my reading of the, the paper and also have a constructive dialogue around <coughs> our interpretation of, 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 uh, of the findings. And I have a quite a pragmatic perspective on this. I'm a, my background is that I'm a nurse. I'm a professor of nursing and coming from the aged care, so very much a long-term care perspective on this. Uh, I thought it was a difficult article to read. 
Uh, there's a lot of information in the article, a lot to sort of sift through and make sense of, uh, which uh, I found interesting. Looking at some of the implications for practice, I thought it's a, it's a good, uh, what do you call it? It could be a good navigator for people that are striving to do interventions because there's a number of interventions described, obviously. So you can look at what's the evidence base, what has people done before uh, in not a super easy format to start to look at if you're not an academic, but it's still there. It's a, it's a pile of gold for people that want to test uh, and replicate existing interventions. Uh, and you can describe, you know, what's, you can also understand what remains to be done. Uh, partly in that sense, I think the, the paper is limited, which all papers are, to what their focus is. And their focus is on evidence in terms of cost and outcomes. And that's important to remember because that leaves ethics, it leaves meanings, it leaves experiences, and it leaves process. So it's, it's quite a focused area on evidence. Uh, and my interpretation is that it's evidence in quite a traditional sense in terms of outcomes and cost, not more experiential evidence or ethical evidence or process evidence. Uh, but all, I mean, they've done well in that sense that everything needs to have a focus and they have a clear focus. Um, I think what we remain, what we can learn from this is, you know, that there's quite a disparate set of outcomes. I'm sure Rick, Rick will come into that, but also quite different interventions. If you summarize, you know, my analysis of, of most of them is that, you know, that they build on an assumption that you train healthcare professionals, in person-centered care and communication, they become better at it, uh, and then you know involve patients uh, and clients uh, and receivers of care in different ways. At the same time, you try to empower the patient group to take more responsibility for their own care, and then you have you know you bring these two together in shared decision making. In essence, that's my re you know they've done that with various flavors to it. Uh, which I think makes sense. Uh, it's it's a linear process. It's described as a linear process, which if I train Rick to become more person-centered and somebody trains me to be more active for my care and we talk to each other, everything will be fine. I'm not quite sure that it's that simple. Uh, I think there's questions around, you know, what type of what type of training do we need? Is there a certain, and GPCC has done work in this space and are doing work in this space, what type of pedagogy and learning do we need to facilitate, you know, not just provision of person-centered care, but involvement in, from, on behalf of patients, uh, not just training, I think we need courage. There's, there's a number of things that are needed to, uh, to more actively involve and get patients to take responsibility for their care. I think, <coughs> I could not really see in the paper uh, more more systemic approaches in terms of the context. Uh, the article, in its aim to 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 synthesize or at least narratively synthesize the evidence, they have a very broad inclusion criteria where they go across diagnostic groups, but also across diagnostic contexts, and I think that's challenging. It's good as a navigator of what's out there, but what we probably need to focus more on, and they say that in the start of the discussion of the paper, is the operationalization of person-centered care. So what does this mean for people with autism, people with a particular you know, diagnosis of autism, and for the individual? And that's really where I see the challenges in person-centered care, that as academics and as researchers, we are very focused on generating population level evidence based on a concept that essentially is personal. So what the care that I would like to receive uh, and then get the level of involvement that I would like, I believe it's very different if I'm 85 years old and have dementia living in a residential care unit or if I'm 19 years old with a STD wanting to get this out of my life. So I think it's 
it's admirable but problematic to try to span all the diagnostic groups. Uh, and I think the questions that I would like to discuss is how do we, what's the next step in terms of looking at more specificity? Uh, and as Rick said this morning when we had a conversation, what is effective for whom and where? And I think that sort of sums it up. The other, the second thing that I found interesting is, uh, apart from GPCC receiving lots of cred in this paper, <laughs> it's basically the world uh, <coughs> authority in the field, which is great, and I totally agree, uh, but the number of papers that lack the theoretical component to it, I think that, again, reinforces that it's, it's sort of a, it's a very popular concept, it's something that ensures that, you know, it's, it's a buzzword, and some people treat it as a buzzword. And I think if you if you lack the theory behind an intervention, the, the start is not great. So I think, and the amount of articles that then had that, or, or interventions that were sort of theoryless, is is a concern. I think, but it's good to know which ones they are. So it's a good good map of that. Uh, and I think because that theory is then intimately connected to the ethics of person-centered care, which GP GPCC is great with. Because coming from a clinical background, I think it's all about the ethics. It's about caring for another person, trying to understand what is important for this individual, respecting those choices and supporting the person uh, to live the best life that they can with the disease that they have. And that will be slightly different for individuals, for groups. And I think that's really when person-centered care comes to life. It's the challenge of person-centered care, but the ethics, if we forget about the ethics, doing good for this person, even though this person might have different priorities to me as a professional or to me as a person, uh, and balancing that, my professional role with that relationship that we d develop with patients, is a second area. So I think, you know, great with ethics, the studies that lacks that theoretical grounding is problematic in my view. Uh, the next, the third thing would be to dig deeper into these diagnostic groups in this context. And it's almost like I would like to see a top 10 list of, you know, what is person-centered care in a residential care environment? And I think that can be done. And I think, you know, GPCC had done some of that work, but it's almost like it's a, we need to be confident that academics to start, you know, targeting the groups that are supposed to implement this, to write in a language that people understand. You know, what characterizes a residential care facility that is highly person-centered? What are the 10 most important things? They won't apply be applicable for everyone every time, but more often than not, these things are the most important things to consider for these conditions, in these environments, and these individuals. I think that would be really interesting to see. So ethics, theory, practice. The last thing, and pardon me, I'm very analog, as Axel pointed out at the start of the seminar. <laughs> uh, is, you know, that I think we can learn from the interventions, but we need to treat them less linearly than what they are described as. I mean, the format of an academic publication requires us to follow certain standards, but reading between the lines, I think the logic of, you know, exposing training to people that are then delivering that training to a third group and then measuring outcomes that may or may not, and I hope that Rick will talk more about that, that may or may not be sensitive enough, relative, relevant enough for the individual to detect those effects is, is sort of a big ask. Uh, so in summary, I, it's a really valuable paper. It take, takes a fair bit of brain power and dialogue to understand it, I think, but also to, to dissect the implications. Uh, so I really value this, this conversation with colleagues and, and hopefully questions from the audience around how can we understand this, how can we work with this to make the concepts more real, more, more important and more grounded in the everyday of the people we are here to serve, which are different people depending on our different perspectives as, as professionals. So that's my beginning understanding of the paper. Thank you.
perfect. Thank you, David. And I mean, you were into, uh, into said it already about outcomes and the evaluation of it, and that's why it's so nice to have Rick here also. And you really opened up my mind about every time I discuss with you, Rick, about the measurement and evaluation. It's for me. I've been trained a couple of years ago. Measurement is kind of paper and pen and some instrument that I don't understand how I do it statistical, but it could be so much more. It's and when we discuss it, it's not only maybe an outcome, it's also some sort of almost a process in itself. So uh, please, if you could bring uh, your view on, on, on the, uh, the evidence, but also future implication. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for this opportunity. It's wonderful to have this discussion. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to bring uh, measurements and evaluation points of view. And really, a lot of what you said, David, actually applies to the context of measurements. Um, and I'm not going to summarize much of the article right now, because I think <laughs> we, we've covered that, basically. Um, but um, you talked about person. Person, also uh, f the focus or the person-centeredness or the personhood also needs to be reflected in the outcomes that we measure and how we measure those outcomes. Uh, you talked about theory. Well, measurement implies a theory. When we construct a measure, that measure reflects the theory. When we measure cost, that cost reflects the theory. It reflects, reflects the theory. Are we thinking about system level cost to the healthcare system, societal cost to society, personal level cost uh, to individual people at home <laughs> uh, or in their daily lives? So theory is equally important to measurements, as is ethics. Ethics has a lot to do uh, in the context of measurement with um, uh, equity. Um, so ma making sure that the perspectives of diverse uh, people are reflected in an honest and equitable manner in how we measure their perspectives about their health and quality of life and so on. Um, and you also talked about practice. Um, well, so measurement validity or measurement validation is actually a practice. It's a whole process by which we come to understand what the measurements and what the outcomes actually mean. So one of the key things is that measurement and measurement validity is not a static thing. Validity is actually should be a verb. It's validation. It's an ongoing pro process. It is never an attribute of the tool. <laughs> a tool is never valid or not valid. It is valid for some pur purposes and less valid for other purposes. And so measurement validity is a process. And that brings me then to considering the outcomes and the evaluations that have been done in this review. And um, I think there's a lot of value in kind of thoroughly tabulating, basically. Uh, it's more than summarizing. There's synthesis, but it's a really thorough tabulation of what's out there. And it's an enormous amount of work. I don't envy the amount of work that people have put into writing this review and doing this study. So that's, that's so none of what I, I uh, am going to say now is meant to discredit that in any way. Um, but the work does reflect certain perspectives. And I think the one I want to comment on most is that it reflects a perspective of what in measurement theory is often referred to as nomothetic measurement. It is a form of where we look at outcomes that matter to most people on average. The emphasis is on averages. And of course, it's a by necess necessity an, an attribute of regularly uh, uh, conducted clinical trials, which was the focus. And that aligning with what you said, uh, David, would be, I think there is, is a gap. I, I, I don't think they actually fully unpacked the notion of outcomes. They only unpacked a certain type of outcomes. And those are nomothetic outcomes that come from an RCT point of view. But of course, there's many other ways beyond RCTs than measuring outcomes. And, and some, so in some contexts, they may be even more valid than RCTs. Um, 
So this nomothetic paradigm, I think, uh, would be ideal if that could be reflected in the title. Um, like when we say, like the what, what was the title again? Um, focusing on on health outcomes. I would say focusing on average outcomes <laughs> would help to situate this more because I think the person-centeredness and the individual differences is missing in that. So in measurements, we have this kind of continuum between the nomothetic and the ideographic, and the ideographic comes much more closer to the person. Ideographic measurement has to do with the person's story. It has to do with individual differences. It has to do with not just paying attention to the average. And this is not saying that the average is not important. Of course it's important. But it's not the only thing that's important. And from a person-centered point of view, we're surely Equ uh, at least equally, if not more, interested in understanding individual differences. How are diverse people impacted uh, by these interventions? For whom this is, does this intervention work? How does it work? How does it, for whom does it not work? And in what circumstances? Um, so building on the foundation, like very rich and large foundation of, of um, evidence-based research, um, on person-centered interventions in the context of serious illness, I think there is a, a great opportunity to now look at not only those averages, but the variability across those averages and to pay attention. Let's put those averages to the side for a moment and see what is not represented in those averages. What are the dispersion across those averages and uh, can we understand uh, relevant individual differences in, in outcomes being measured? Um, the other, other characteristic then of this, this type of nomothetic measurement uh, approach is that it assumes that our populations are in fact homogeneous. You can only meaningful interpret an average if you could draw a bell curve <laughs> on a population and you can only draw a bell curve on a population if that population is assumed to be homogeneous. But we all know that our populations are not homogeneous, of course. And so I think we need to pay more attention to understanding this diversity in our sample. And in my view, this study, this review is an invitation towards that. Sometimes what is not in the review is more or at least as informative of what is in the review. And I think there's a big gap here, and that is looking at, at these individual differences. Um, by ignoring these individual differences in these, uh, the, this diversity, um, we contribute noise in our measurement. Basically, those individual differences get treated as if they're noise. They're not noise, of course, but they get treated as if, as if they're noise because we're using a population average model. And when we put that much noise in our model, then we have a hard time detecting effect. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's one of the main reasons why uh, these kind of subjective outcomes to do with quality of life and well-being and self-efficacy and so on why these types of outcomes often do not show an effect. And that, that was in part the result of this, this review. Um, and when they do show an effect, um, often it's a very small effect. <laughs> um, and that, 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 I must say, it is a little bit too bad in the review. They said nothing in the review about magnitude of effect. Of course, we recognize heterogeneity. We can't do a meta-analysis fine, but we could still say something about magnitude, or at least get some idea about what the magnitude is. Because when it's written that, that effects are significant, I don't know what that means. Does it mean it has a p-value because it's a very large sample and becomes statistically significant, or was there actually some magnitude attached to it? So that's a question that I'm le left with. Um, so I think there is an, an invitation here to, to think about how we measure and what we measure um, and to tailor that to, to diverse people. And I think I'll, I'll end with that the same applies to methodological advances. Um, RCTs are important, of course. They're important for establishing causal relationships that work on, uh, 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 for most people. Um, but there are other types of designs that are needed uh, to really figure out 
what works for whom and where and in what context. And I think the MRC framework does a good job of kind of outlining some of the different designs that could be used, like realistic evaluation methodologies, like mixed methods types of approaches that really help us to, to dig a little bit deeper rather than just coming out with this binary answer, does it work or does it not work? And it relates back to this importance of, of theory um, where, you know, in a, whether it works or doesn't work, that assessment doesn't require a theory. You just put the intervention there and find out whether it works or doesn't work. But as, as you've said already, David, it, it's likely a lot more complex than that. These are not very simple causal paths. These are very complex relationships, uh, processes that, that we need to understand. Um, so I think that there, it was really enriching and I really deeply value this opportunity and uh, the work that was done on this article. I think it provides huge opportunity to take a next step. Um, and, um, you know, we can view this article, I think, mostly as kind of describing, describing the field. It's not, they're not really saying how it ought to be. It's a descriptive synthesis. It's not a normative synthesis. But now maybe we could take a next step and, and dig a little bit deeper. Um, and I th yeah, I think I'm going to leave it there because I really want to know what you have to say too. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And then we come to Eva, of course. And I'm so glad that you're here because I think that for me at least, uh, healthcare governance, which I hope that you also could explain a little bit more what healthcare governance is, is, is something that I need to understand more and also understand how could you then, uh, with the evidence that we have and the knowledge that we have, how could we then make an impact also on, on a policy level? And that's why I think also it's so important that we now have a center for health, uh, healthcare governance here at the University of Gothenburg. So please, Eva, can you take us through uh, your view on, on this article from a governance perspective. Yes, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, dialogue. And, and hopefully we could discuss uh, the different implications from our different perspectives. Yes, health governance uh, is an, a research area that span over a rather wide range of different issues, from governance and organizational issues to issues concerning cost effectiveness of different treatments. But it also covers public health and global health and policy implementation and policy governance. Uh, and, of course, collaboration betre between different actors and, and how we could collaborate in order to, to create the most qualitative driven care that we could accomplish. And I would like, in order to discuss uh, the implication of this article and the different themes highlighted in this article, I would like to look, look backwards before we look forwards and, and discuss the future. And uh, looking at health governance and the, the governance area in relation to patient-centered care, we could see that in the beginning of the 80s, if we go back to the 80s, 1980s, we can see at a societal level that we discussed freedom of choice, the possibility to choose your own care provider as a citizen. And after that, we had a time period that we focused a lot of at a societal level and at the policy level on transparency issues. You should have enough information as a citizen in order to choose your, uh, your uh, care provider and uh, different health care services. And, uh, and then we focused on quality quality management. And after that, there was introduced new uh, issues at the policy level concerning citizen rights and citizen position. And that is still issues that we discuss. And we could hear around the table here that we discuss different groups uh, in, in the population, from small children to the aging population, and the importance of the po how different groups are positioned, but also different persons are positioned. And this is important at the policy level. 
And in the article, we, it is discussed uh, uh, digitalized care and different apps and so on and so forth. And um, also, we could see different, uh, at the policy level, we could see different issues also concerning, for instance, the aging population called aging in, uh, in place policy, that we, we need to be able to, to stay in, in our homes. And that is not only concerning the aging population, but also other different groups in, at the societal level. But looking at these uh, societal challenges, what kind of governance have we had during these de decades? Yes, we see that during the 1980s and 1990s, there were introduced, uh, healthcare was introduced to, and, and, uh, uh, to a, a kind of health governance called new public management. In, and in that, in that uh, time period, we, we focused a lot on costs and economical issues. And we need to understand that because this is still uh, in focus in, in our different uh, um, healthcare organizations. So uh, even if we now talk about new public governance, in practice, we are still uh, um, uh, the inertia to change in practice are still um, caused by uh, a governance system that was introduced in the 1980s. So we have different layers of governance and the inertia to change these layers is depending on that we have lived with them so long. So we have new public management, but we also have quality management and we have management focusing on accessibility issues and risk management. And now we talk a lot about new public governance and health governance systems. The United Nations talk about health public governance and the sustainable development goals. Uh, this, it, it, to focus on sustainability issues and Related to person-centered care, the, in this kind of documents, we see that almost every sustainable development goal includes uh, uh, issues concerning how we create inclusion. And that is very important in order to discuss the different themes in the article, because self-management, what, what does that say? And different digitalized practices, what does that say? What, what kind of challenges occurs uh, in relation to different groups? You have all been into that, that we need to customize the different solutions in relation to different uh, groups in society, different populations and different groups, but also different persons. And in order to do that, we need to focus on participation, dialogue, partnership, and co-production of knowledge and decisions. But that is not really easy. Easy, and we need to have uh, discussed that and have a dialogue concerning th that because otherwise, inclusion uh, will become a buzzword, something without any meaning if we don't discuss that. And we, as a researcher, we need to support practice uh, in order to facilitate this kind of processes. Talking about implementation and intervention of different evidence and also to bring in uh, the persons that needs care. We need to discuss how to to, 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 to uh, construct that kind of inclusion. Because otherwise, self-management uh, will become something for the strong groups and the strong persons in society and marginalized groups and, uh, pre uh, pe uh, and persons with different health issues. We, we risk that we leave them behind and we will not include them as it is uh, described in Agenda 2030. 
and what the United Nations uh, describe as health system governance, where they focus on collaboration and building up and health uh, health system ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem that enables people to manage their own health. But we need really to support uh, the, the groups and the persons that risks to be marginalized. And it's also when we have this kind of digital solution, we have some kind of value propositions. And often regions, when they have a hard time to make decisions con concerning prioritizing between different groups in society, now they, they, they suggest that we should use a di different, for instance, digital platforms in relation, uh, as a value proposition for different persons and different population groups. But we are not sure that this will create value, that this will be a value realization for these persons and these groups. And in order to bridge the gap between a value proposition, for instance, a digital solution, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, to, to, uh, to reach the goal of a value realization for the person, that is a rather difficult journey. So that is, a dif uh, some, uh, that is a challenge for the future that we need to have a dialogue on in order not to, to create new buzzwords. So the different home-based solution and working with prevention and enabling control and enabling governance, we need to address how to translate this into person-centered care in order to create this kind of inclusion that the United Nations uh, describe in their policy documents concerning sustainable development goals. So I think this is an interesting article that uh, focus on, for instance, self-management, but, but also digital, uh, different digital solutions. But we need to move that some more steps forward and discuss how to translate this in practice in order to create inclusion for different person and different uh, population groups in order not to create marginalized patterns um, and, and difficulties for, for groups that, that are at risk to become marginalized in society. So that, I stop there and thank you. Thank you very much for all of your input because it's very interesting and as a representative for the council here at GPCC and who talks about the groups that you are talking about, the variety within the groups and how they can contribute to your research but also in their own care. So I'm curious about what benefits do you see if you can make these representatives more participating when it comes to the research, trying to find as you're talking about the clues and the studies, what we can do better, what we need to do. So we start with you, David, because you talked about it earlier a little bit. No, I think it's absolutely essential and to understand, uh, to understand the priorities and challenges that, that, that groups and individuals have, have and, and thank you for raising it, Eva. It's, mm -hmm. you know, translating it and, and, and it's probably the most vulnerable and marginalized groups that are, you know, at risk of, you know, not, not, not feeling that value. Uh, and certainly in today's society, uh, with all the technology interventions, all the people, you know, you can barely take a bus without having an app. You can't, we couldn't order lunch today because everything had to be through swish <laughs> if you if you're still writing in one of these some of these <laughs> technological interventions can be challenging for me with you know and let alone these groups that that we try to focus on so i absolutely and in the gpcc again the theory and the ethics of having a partnership you know is is really a strong point in gpcc and i think it's it's reflected in everything that they do uh, and the research projects, and, and I think I'm absolutely confident that that's a recipe for the success, to not forget about the individual, not forget about the people that 
we are here to serve, basically, both as researchers and as clinicians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, Rick, and I was wondering about the measurement because it's so complex. Mm -hmm. We were talking about it earlier before we started here that the person that you care for has a complex issue. It's not just one thing. I represent the people that have autism, but you can have autism and you can also have a serious illness. Mm -hmm. How do you think you can measure the experience for that person when it comes to person-centered care? Well, yeah, um, measurements indeed um, we, we come from a, a history of thinking that our measurements need to be standardized and equally applicable to all people. And it basically f reflects an assumption that experience means the same thing to all people, which is an odd assumption. And we probably know that to be nonsensical. <laughs> and yet that's what we do. <laughs> and so, um, so we need to change how we think about measurements. Mm -hmm. We need to realize that certain people need to answer different questions. And uh, some questions may be relevant to some people and not to well other people. And how do we put then, if we're not asking the same questions of different people and different people are interpreting the same questions in different ways, how do we then put that all into one measurement framework? And that's what, what equitable people-centered health <laughs> measurement is about. Um, so it's a, a theory of, of how you actually t tease together um, uh, different questions answered by different people and interpreted by d different people. So in, in Canada, we, we well, all over the world, we have all kinds of examples. But one of the predominant examples drawing a lot of attention nationally and internationally in Canada right now is, of course, the indigenous populations. And they've not been well represented at all in our outcomes evaluations, also not evaluations of person-centered care. They probably have a very different definition of what person-centered care means, at least from an experiential point of view. Mm. And they have very different perspectives of how they think about their health and health outcomes and what that means. It's not something that's distinctly separate from other areas of life. Um, spirituality might be an, a core piece of how people think about their health, for instance. And so, um, yeah, tailored measurement, I think, it is where we need to be, be heading with that. Mm -hmm. And we need to uh, resist uh, the, this, this idea, thinking that we have this standardized tool that's been used for 30 years in, in all these people. And when it's a valid tool. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that it's valid for these people. Um, and that doesn't mean that something hasn't changed over 30 years that <laughs> makes its validity questionable. So we, I do think there is really much a, an, a, a person-centered lens of thinking about measurement validation that ne needs to be core to the agenda going forward. Yeah. If we can't measure our outcomes in, in an equitable way, yeah. then how, however are we going to draw attention to uh, underserved or, or marginalized groups? Right. That is so very true because they rarely get hurt. Exactly. So, so they they're kind of hurt. invisible in this kind of work. Yeah, and, and even worse, they, they rarely get hurt, and, but they may even be misrepresented. Exactly. <laughs> so, so if they are, are measured, they might actually be measured wrong, and that, that's even worse. That is right. Yes, and Eva, I was wondering yes. when it comes to governance, because mm -hmm. a lot of these people, they have need of different caregivers, mm -hmm. and it's hard for them to kind of organize themselves trying yeah. to get the right care. Yeah. What challenges did you see just talking about this translation of what yeah. we're doing and how we... And, and, and also um, pa uh, patients that um, uh, have a comorbidity, right. uh, they, uh, there you can see uh, an even more complexity. And in Sweden right now we talk about different uh, standardized care flows connected to different diagnoses, but uh, the patient that, uh, and you have different evidence on different uh, levels that you should follow. So we have a, some, somehow a knowledge management uh, way of working mm -hmm. that could be good for patients that only have one diagnosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you are a patient that has both uh, schizophrenia and depression, for instance, right. or an addiction and uh, depression or something. Uh, they uh, need different uh, care uh, providers and also a communication between the care providers in order to get a more holistic perspective <coughs> uh, 
uh, on everyday life and treatments. Uh, it, it's very difficult. And that, that's also why we d talk about governance, because um, uh, new public governance focuses more on collaboration and coordination between the care providers and how to accomplish this. But we need, uh, but, uh, but here we also have a challenge because we, we can see in, in our study, not only in Sweden, but also at a European level that in different regions, they try to accomplish this uh, by using, for instance, digital platforms. And in, construction, in constructing this kind of digital platforms, you, you often hear that they use uh, the label persona. Mm -hmm. They are creating a, a digital platform and they are creating, for instance, an older person with uh, with the different kind of needs and how to create a digital platform that both connects the care providers but also connect for instance um, uh, family members and uh, and other kind of stuff and this is very good mm. but it's it's not person centered care mm. so the the uh, the uh, solution suggested at the societal level and in different regions uh, i think they are very good but we need to understand that they are value propositions and in order to to uh, to move from looking at them as a from a persona perspective the constructed person really mm. uh, to a person centered care we need to bridge this and uh, using an uh, enabling governance and by that i mean that the care providers they will learn using this kind of digital platforms and solutions and you need to build in the learning in order to and create the flexibility in the governance structure uh, and this is hard because governance is focusing on control and fix have a fixation of things but uh, but in order to create this kind of new public governance focusing on coordination and and uh, complexities mm -hmm. we need to build in a learning dimension yeah. so we need to be build in an enabling dimension mm -hmm. built on learning very good, thank you. And it's, I'm so glad to hear all of you talking about this variety because that's also, of course, my concern. Mm -hmm. People are complex. They have different needs of care in different parts of life and in different situations. And as you all say, we need to look upon all that. But me, as a non-researcher, I'm of course wondering, is this possible? Can you actually manage to do this without getting, as Rick was into, the wrong measurements? How do you get a good representative doing research for this huge variety of people. Now, I'm not directing the question to any of you because I'm thinking it's quite <laughs> But complex. I also think that that could be a very, very nice cliffhanger <gasps> so that we keep our audience. <laughs> so, uh, because time flies. Yes. Yeah. And I think that we uh, s will start on next session after the break with these that questions. Question, yes. And uh, before the break, I just want to, to highlight that we are going to have the first global conference in person-centered care here in Gothenburg in May next year and you are all warm welcome uh, because we welcome uh, the global community of course of both healthcare professionals researchers citizens patients and informal carers and we are right now accepting abstracts for posters and symposiums and oral presentation but also workshops so please provide us with with a lot of ideas maybe from this uh, seminar and you can find more on, on the homepage and also prices and such. And what happens now is that we will take a 15 minute break uh, where we also will look at uh, the questions that come in from, from, from the audience in the chat. And we will come back at, uh, when we'll come back? Now I need to see the clock. Uh, what time is it? It's, it's 5 2 almost. 5 2? Yes. So five when two. we are back then, then it's. Uh, ten past. Ten past four. We will be back here in the studio and we'll discuss the questions that we had in the chat, beginning with your questions. Yes. Perfect. Great. Thank you.
everybody. Nice to see you again. I almost said, but I don't see you. But it's nice that you're back. And we left you with a cliffhanger last time, and we're going to spend the next 20 minutes answering your questions and uh, maybe some of our own to discuss what we've just been talking about. The question that I asked the panel was kind of complex, and we'll see if they want to answer it, but it's how can you include this variety of people that we were talking about, because they have complex issues and complex situations. So how can we include them in the research, trying to find out more about their situations? So maybe I'm looking at you, Eva, because I'm yeah. thinking about the governance. How yeah. can we... We, 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 we know uh, from research concerning user involvement and uh, uh, research projects that, that have tried to involve and tried different dialogue methods and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. We know that it's hard to, uh, to involve uh, uh, different persons. All citizens and patients are are not willing to participate. And this is really something we need to, to consider. Uh, often, uh, the persons that like to, to be part of research and be part of this kind of dialogue meeting and so on and so forth, we know that they are often persons that are well, well educated from, from uh, strong socioeconomic groups. Yeah. And uh, sometimes they have been part of research before and have a good experience. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to recruit persons that are willing to be part of mm -hmm. research. So I think we have uh, an issue here yeah. that are not easy. You can't buy governance create willingness, but we can work with the invitation and trying to, as I said before, translate research and why it's important mm. to be part of mm. um, uh, this kind of processes. And um, so we need to learn more on how to include and how to create an environment that are safe in order for different persons to be part of research. Yeah. So we learn more uh, about different uh, groups and, and also different persons' needs and how to include. So this is not easy. Right. We know that it's hard. And that's very good to be just mindful about yeah. that it is a challenge, yeah. that it needs to be addressed. Yeah. Now, David, you're talking about as a pr practitioner, how do you include in person-centered care these groups? Do you have any tips that can translate over to research? Mm. <coughs> no, <laughs> it's the short <laughs> answer. <laughs> Sorry, I put no, I think it's it's a really important question, but it's 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 yeah, uh, we haven't. I don't think we've done that well in mm. some of the studies that we've done. We've had reference groups, we've had mm. patient and public involvement, and it's a really big thing in the university where I'm at. Yeah. But I really, and it's it's on so many levels. I mean, you could you could make a half baked argument that you know if you do qualitative level intervention studies where you work in partnership with patients, that that is one way. Mm. Um, and then the other extreme, I think, is is user-driven research where mm. it's sort of, you know, where yeah. where I think it might have gone a bit too far, I think, mm. you know, and it's a balance and I think that field is constantly changing and, and we're in a time now when I think there's, and we might come back to it, it's, it's almost user-driven research and then do we sacrifice methodological expertise, mm. content expertise, subject matter expertise and uh, to to let the users drive the agenda and lead the research, or or the other way, we just do our academic thing and we mm. collect our data and we do the average outcomes and significance testing and confidence intervals and you know stay in the academic ivory tower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that the the debate is shifting a bit, and I think we're we're sort of in in a very empowered individual time now when when. Uh, for good reasons, yeah. uh, because we have a history of, you know, in research, doing things to people that, you know, they may or may not have mm. been, uh, s had some tick or two. And, and, right. and so we have a bit of a s history to struggle with and sometimes where we are now. So I, I find it really difficult. Yeah. 
Uh, I absolutely think it's important, but I think th th how we do it is depending on the research question. Yeah. What yeah. what are we looking for? Who are we working with? Yeah. So I think the unfortunate answer for me is it depends. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but it is a challenge. Mm. It would have been <laughs> surprising if you had an easy answer mm. for it. So mm. yes, and Rick, you were talking earlier about that we need to ask different questions. Mm -hmm. We need to measure different yeah. things. Yeah. Yes. What do you think about this complexity when it comes to trying to involve? Well, yeah, so I think um, involving people in, in measurements, so measuring how they're doing or what their experiences are and so on, um, there is a couple of conditions for that. But I think from an inclusivity point of view, safety is key. Yeah. People need to feel safe. They need to know that the data they provide, that something meaningful is going to happen with it. Mm -hmm. And they need to feel respected. Yeah. So I don't want to pick on, on any particular tool or something like that. But if you use one of the, the, the big tools in, in self-reported health measurements, mm -hmm. SF36 or something like that, and you plunk it in a context like residential care that we were talking about, and you're then asking people whether they could vacuum. Mm. whether they could walk a flight of stairs. I don't, in Canada, most residential care facilities don't have stairs, mm. but maybe different elsewhere, mm. I don't know. But those questions yeah. become offensive. Yeah. Like they, they actually become, you, you would not ask somebody in front of you exactly. to answer that question. It's, it's rude. Mm. <laughs> and so it, it turns people off. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we've really worked with that. It's mm. experimental. We now have a survey out on equitable people-centered health me measurements, over 100 questions. So we yeah. thought, oh, this is going to be a big problem. It takes more than a half an hour. Um, but we actually have, uh, so far, over 6,000 people that completed it online. Wow. Mm. And, uh, and I, I think it has to do with that really focusing on feeling respected and yeah. safe. Yeah. I think that's, those are key things. Mm. Mm. Very good answer. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think that um, I totally agree. And I think that it, it's it's hard, but uh, it's also that when you talk to patient and public uh, representative and the patient representative, they say that they, it's a tokenism that you have them yes. as a checkbox. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, because there is some sort of governance that you need for finance, uh, financing research, you 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 need to have PPI. And I think that it, it's not easy, like you said. And I mean, I I've surely done interventions where we, we didn't have it, but it, it's a, a, much, uh, a lot about striving forward and to see it as a strategy. I, I, uh, and we have an area of, of uh, a research area right now in, in GPCC about patient public involvement to, to learn more about it because you need a strategy because you need different components in mm -hmm. your PPI strategy, both uh, uh, people from patient organizations, but also patient that are there for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you said is so important that you, they need to feel respected. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that my time that I, I, I do here in the research is, uh, is valid and that you are respected for what you bring to the table mm -hmm. and that you are listened to. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the, m maybe the, the biggest mistake you, you, you do or that I have done is that I have been too late with PPI. Mm -hmm. That you use yeah. patient public involvement maybe in the in the end of the study or maybe in some yeah. component but but it's too late if you come with the sf36 yeah. to mm -hmm. to the, the 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 care home yeah. so i think that was a, a very very interesting uh example of it mm. uh, and and so on i think that um having a strategy is a must then if you uh, how it looks like and also maybe that it's different in different stages that, that is okay but to to now they say that uh, maybe we haven't thought about it mm. i think that's that doesn't cut it anymore yeah. mm, that's right okay. now we have a question here from the chat that i think the panel wants to answer the question is does person centered care always involve healthcare professionals or can person centered care also be the interventions between the person and for example the next of kin the more informal care mm -hmm. so how do you view that how do you see is it, can we, because it's a definition of person-centered mm. care that they're after, I'm thinking. 
Well, I, I can just reason from my perspective where, <clears throat> you know, in aged care and dementia, this the whole person-centered discourse came from a frustration with the medical paradigm where mm. things were, you know, done to people without, you know, uh, that there was an assumption that with dementia, your personhood is eroded and ultimately mm. disappears and hence you can do you can do for people without involving them. So I think in that sense, the more the person-centered dialogue came to balance the medical, medicalized, biomedical reduction. Mm. Uh, mm. But that's true for that context. I mean, in some other, some studies that we've done, so I believe that, you know, in formal care, it's easy to make a hypothesis that it's more person-centered because you might know the person mm -hmm. better. Uh, but all, all levels of care... <clears throat> or maybe not all levels of care, but a lot of levels of care requires professional mm -hmm. training, you know, expertise in subject matters, mm -hmm. evidence about what works and doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, and we all have seen risks and examples if you remove that professionalism mm -hmm. or that educational level mm -hmm. from more professionalized care or care that requires some sort of a medical, social mm biological, chemical, whatever the expertise might be, mm. uh, what can happen? So in my world, you know, informal care can work to a certain extent, but at some point in the trajectory, depending on diagnostic group or context, mm. you may need some, some expert knowledge. And I think it's then the, the, the interesting, interesting uh, tension becomes between the medical opinion and expertise and yeah. advice and the personal yeah. choice. Yeah. I don't think quite see that, you know, in the informal care, it might be highly person-centered, but then you might lack the other dimension. Exactly. If that makes sense, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Happy to yeah. be Absolutely. challenged. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Does any of you have a different view upon this? Because informal care can be from different, uh, there can be different reasons for it. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be the reason that you don't trust the caregivers. So that's why you have informal care. But it can also be, like you were talking about, that you start at a caregiver and then you bring it home. And then there will be more informal care. So, and as you said, there might be need of professional care, but it's also a combination of mm -hmm. the informal care. Mm -hmm. At least here in Sweden, that's a huge Thing. It's a huge part of the care given in Sweden. It's the informal mm -hmm. care. So, so it. Um, I'm thinking the question they, they ask is really it could be both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Since, and you probably need both. Well, yes. you, you, yeah, you need both. I think. I mean, we often talk about circle of care, of course, yeah. and, and and that would include both formal and informal care. Yeah. One thing I would add. I completely agree with with all that was said. Uh, one thing I would add is. Um, Viewing the the inform I don't really like the word informal actually, but but viewing what we call inf the informal <laughs> carers, say, um, or the family caregiver, or uh, what, what, what whichever label you want to give us, um, as as both a provider and a recipient of care. So that informal carer also has care needs, and I credit um, colleagues in the UK, um, Gail Ewing and. Um, uh, Goon Grande, who developed the, the care um, uh, supportive needs assessment tool, who really framed it along those lines, that the, the carer as a recipient of care and the carer as a provider of care. And that might help mm. to make that bridge that mm. we're talking about of needing mm. both. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking what you talked about earlier, Eva, about the complexity with different caregivers yeah. and trying to map out. Yeah, so that and of course... At every level, and at, uh, and and uh, you can have this person-centered approach and focus, of mm. course. So um, yes, and I'm also thinking about different cultures that yeah. we have. In some cultures, it's more customers that you do it at home. Yeah. As much care is given home as possible. You often want a whole group of people around. You just yeah. don't want one people, and that might not be possible if you're at a hospital. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, as you said, this person-centered care yeah. can be given in all those instances yeah. in different ways. Yeah. 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 And I'm thinking, Axel, that's what you're working with at GPCC, looking upon all those different layers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, no, exactly. And I think that... Um, 
I think David mentioned it uh, early on. The, the, a, a partnership is the, the key concept here. And uh, that's why, I mean, we, we started when GPCC started in 2010. Uh, the name was person-centered, even mm -hmm. if, the, if the term patient-centered care was, mm -hmm. the, was the big right. term from, from uh, not at least the US. Uh, uh, but nowadays I, I read a, a new publication from uh, Circulation that they also framed it in person-centered care because mm -hmm. I think that person-centeredness M goes not only between patient and professional, mm -hmm. goes professional, professional, yeah. uh, patient carriers, so on, but also in different levels in that sense. Mm -hmm. And how we can figure those steps out and also how we take it from a bedside approach, uh, if you call it bedside approach, mm -hmm. or some call it micro level approach, mm -hmm. up to the macro level is, I mean, that's the million dollar question here. So, uh, yeah. And um, I would ask you, all of you, uh, hearing and, and listening to you is wonderful. Mm. I totally like it. And I just think that if you are a, a young researcher or starting your career or, or a patient organization that wants to initiate some sort of study, um, how, would you, how would you do it? when the, the structure still today is like, you mentioned SF46, but it's, it's a little bit that um, traditionally you said that the, you can't be fired if you buy IBM. It's the mm -hmm. same thing here. They use the traditional instrument mm -hmm. that everyone knows, and maybe it's easier, but those instruments mm -hmm. maybe aren't uh, good enough. Yeah. So, so how could, is it that uh, senior researchers, we as senior researchers don't uh, need to be more educated in new methods mm -hmm. or, or ways of thinking or, or what would be your tips for the, the, the researchers that are starting out or, or also patient public involvement. Like, like I know that a lot of patient organizations are, are thinking about, okay, how can we support the question and, and mm -hmm. starting to think about, okay, maybe we could, should also come with some sort of idea. Mm -hmm. Big that question. was a really, really hard <laughs> question to, to ask now in the end. But I mean, we still have two start? hours. Or? Yes, <laughs> yes, no, no. no but, but of course, we are we as, as senior researchers, you you have uh, you have a hard time to think outside the box. And of course, the, the junior ones and the newly recruited PhD students, of course, they could um, maybe get inspired from different perspective in another way than we have been. But on the other hand, you can say that the ju our junior colleagues and, and newly recruited PhD students, they, they have a hard time because they have a pressure mm -hmm. on, on being published within their own area and not only, and not, yeah. they are forced to work uh, one disciplinary, as, uh, with a one disciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. But when you are senior, you can use this more multidisciplinary approach because you don't have uh, a lot of new career targets. So I, I guess that um, even if it's easier for them to be creative and maybe get inspired from, from other perspective and fields, mm -hmm. they have another type of pressure. And I have a hard time to see to use this kind of holistic approach, I think, mm -hmm. because they are pushed to to publish mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. it's not an answer, but... Uh, it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, we're we're weighed by a cut out yeah. paradigm shifts. Yeah. You know, uh, how, do you, how do you change how, uh, people's ideas? And, and we know that people generally don't change their ideas. So yeah. it's a difficult shift to make. But I do think um, for new researchers, uh, people new in the field um, really needing to, uh, it, it takes a lot to be courageous and you really need to be yeah. courageous yeah. and you really need to not care about some things. Like, you know, this journal has a high impact factor, but it's not going to publish this because it doesn't use this tool. Mm. Forget about that horrible impact factor and go to the journal that will publish yeah. it. Mm. So you get your, your information out. Yeah. So I think we need to challenge yeah. our systems. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's a very very good question. It, it doesn't have a, an easy answer, but I think don't 
rock up with ice skates to a basketball game. <clears throat> that would be my first advice, you know. <laughs> what is the game you're playing? Mm -hmm. Make sure you know the game and you play the game. You know, there are rules and we're in, we're in different paradigms. So I think if that's what you want, if you want to produce high level evidence, if you want to, you know, you better get your head around what's required to do that. Mm -hmm. But also stay with the problem. What is the problem what, that you're trying to solve and why is it important? And is it important to anybody but yourself? Mm -hmm. So I think today sometimes we miss, you know, why is this important? We have lots of, well, this study aims to do to explore the perspectives of a 50-year-old white male mm. from Norland who lives in Australia. I think that's really important, but does anybody else think that? Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's multiple answers to that question, yeah. but I think, you know, depending on where you want to go and the impact that you want your research to have, and that's impact in a multitude of ways. Is mm. it an academic impact? Is it a practical impact? Is it a policy impact? Mm. Is it a, you know, user involvement impact, I think you need to design and think quite differently. And my advice to young researchers would be to try to be as try to be a decathlete, to start the word, mm. you know, master ten different sports. <laughs> know an RCT when you see one, you know, be able to do that, but also be able to influence policy. Mm. You know, develop toolboxes so that you can answer because you will meet very different questions and problems. So if you have you know, if you have a hammer, everything is a nail. Mm. But if you have a toolbox, you can you can work with lots of problems. Yeah. Good. Yes. Thank you. Well. Wow. <laughs> yes, Axel. That was a very good ending on the discussion, don't you think? To use a hammer for all. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, um, no, I agree. And I uh, I think it's time to wrap it up. I would really like to thank our experts. I want to thank you also as a co-host. Oh, thank you. Uh, lovely as thank always. You. And I want to thank you, audience, that you have been listening to us. Uh, we have recorded it, so you can go in and look at our social media and subscribe to our newsletter, but also our YouTube channel where we'll have this uh, seminar. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to, to email us at GPCC, and we are going to try to uh, answer them or at least learn from them. Those words... Thank you so much and have a nice evening. Bye. <laughs>